I'm in a rather hypnotic state now. So if you were to ask me for my social security and bank account info, I might willingly give them up. So congrats. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Trip Sitting Podcast, where we explore what it means to be human. I am your host, Cam Leeds, and I am feeling just unbelievably thankful and grateful right now. And no, that's not just because Thanksgiving is about to come up, but uh, just a conversation that I had with my guest, Dennis Walker, aka the micropreneur uh follow his new handle micropreneur official uh as he did just get uh deplatformed uh earlier this week uh, which we do touch on in the podcast but um i'm really grateful just for so many of the authentic and genuine connections that this platform trip sitting has has allowed me to make over the last year um i'm grateful to everybody that listens to this and everybody that supports me and gives me new ideas and and inspires me to continue along this path that I don't know where it's going to take me, but uh, I just feel very, very confident and and blessed to know that I am on the right path. Um, So just so much love. But uh, I know that's not what you came here for. You came here to listen to Dennis. Um, Before you do that, make sure you're following Trip Sitting on Instagram at tripsitting.blog and TikTok TikTok, at tripsitting.blog. Um, and then also make sure that you are following the podcast so you don't miss any of the episodes. And if you wouldn't mind, maybe, you know, give it a rating. Um, that way we can get in front of more people. Uh, that's all I got for you before we get into it. So here is Dennis. I'd like to welcome to the trip sitting podcast, my good dear friend, Daniel Walker. Love it. (laughs) <laughs> i knew where you were going with that right away yeah 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 of course um i had to you know what's so what's what's actually funny i was actually just looking when we uh when we recorded our first podcast and it was almost exactly one year ago today it was on it was on the 23rd of november last year and today's the 20th of november so it's almost been exactly a year amazing well i'm honored to be back so thank you again and i hope we can do this next year at this time Oh, one hundred percent too. You're also actually my 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 first repeat guest, so 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 you 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 now hold that very very esteemed honor. Epic, epic honor. <laughs> um, well, Dennis, man, it was great. To, obviously, it was great seeing you in Miami. It's always always a fucking pleasure. Um, I read your write up in Lucid News uh, about Wonderland, um, and I, I think the where I first want to talk the my. Nah, my first talking point is is I want to talk about uh, the legacy market, um, which I know that you did uh, a panel on and sort of where you see the legacy market, I guess, fitting into this current psychedelic renaissance of, of you know, legality and, 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 and all that bullshit. Absolutely. I think all of the different access points and models be it talking about a clinical, legal, therapeutic industry, which is emerging religious and spiritual use, which is a robust model, lots of entheogenic churches, including some of our mutual friends who are running some. And then the legacy market or the underground market, what some people might call even the black market or the gray market. All of these access points and models need each other. I think that's the first point that there's no one size fits all when you're talking about something like psychedelics. Even if you look at different tribes around the world, they all have different rituals and different ways of accessing and using entheogens and visionary plants and these technologies, if you will, as I saw you discuss on a recent podcast. And so that's the first thing I want to say. And the legacy market, as we call it, is really what's fulfilling most of the demand out there. Like you think about clinical trials and they dominate the headlines and there's all of the media and all of the discussion around psychedelics and psilocybin for PTSD and for depression, et cetera, et cetera. But how many people do you know that have actually done a clinical trial? Very few. And then think about all the people you know and yourself and our communities who have accessed mushrooms from their neighbor or they grew them or a community access model. That's going to be 99% of them, quite frankly. So I think that's the first thing to note. And also, I imagine you can attest to this, as can anyone who lives in Colorado, in various decriminalized cities like in Santa Cruz or Humboldt, or goes to these psychedelic conferences. There are a ton of really professional branded products floating around between the mushroom chocolates, 
the DMT vapes. I got MDMA gummies that popped up. Somebody had, you see them everywhere. And of course there are opportunities opportunists and unscrupulous actors who are going to introduce trap chocolates that maybe have 4-ACO DMT instead of psilocybin or whatever. But those are the exceptions to the rule. The norm is that you're going to get really quality products and typically they're going to be coming from professionals who are making these. So I think that's the first point I want to make about the legacy market. It's not this big bad boogeyman about someone putting drugs in your kid's Halloween candy. It's actually <laughs> stepping up to fulfill a huge demand that exists right now, which are people want access to mushrooms and to psychedelics. And if brands can fulfill that and can do so in a transparent community framework, insofar as they're empowered to, considering it's still a criminalized or illicit market, then yeah, like uh, there's plenty of brands that I'd recommend and I'm sure you have some that you would as well. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, I've seen some like really, really amazing packaging and like marketing that's also like going behind these brands too. Like they're not just tiny little underground brands anymore that are just operating out of like one little tiny sector of a city. Like you see some of these brands nationwide now, um, like they have a whole like distribution model, which I think is, is really, really amazing. And, and, you know, I hope that, I hope that they can get brought into, you know, the, the, the emerging legal market as well. Um, within the framework that, you know, like the, the U S or, or whatever country it may be is, is, is actually trying to create because like those guys have been doing it for so long. Whereas like, I think a lot of the people that are getting into it legally now are still pretty new to this. And from, from what I see more so the opportunists than the people that have been working with these substances for, you know, their entire lives and actually building that relationship. And like, that was something that you, that you stressed a lot in your, uh, in your article, um, was about how it's, it's those people that have been building relationships with these substances throughout time. Those are the ones that are going to actually prevail at the end. A hundred percent. And of course it goes without saying that this also includes just regular mushrooms, not even just branded products, but mm -hmm. people who have been working underground and providing their community and, and the broader public with access to these substances. So that's the first thing. And also super important to note that a lot of the people who have the money to finance more of a biotech approach takes big money. It takes huge money to do clinical trials and to go through that model. So a lot of more marginalized communities are going to be largely ostracized or, or mitigated from participating in that model, excluded just on the basis that they don't have millions of dollars of capital. Who does have millions of dollars of capital? A lot of people pivoting in from other industries and who have existing relationships. And I don't want to knock that. I think it's tremendously beneficial for a subset of the population who want to go through their general provider, want to go through a medicalized system. And I definitely have been critical of that model only insofar as I don't think that should be the only predominant model. I think it's ridiculous to say that you have to do mushrooms in a clinic and it has to be this way. If somebody had really deeply uh, treatment resistant depression and that's the route they felt called to, of course, that makes sense. Right. But like mm -hmm. for the rest of the public and Paul Austin says this from third wave is what about the betterment of people who are already well? Like, why can't we use mushrooms and psychedelics if we're already feeling great and we don't have any diagnosed mental illness? We just want to use it in whatever capacity we see fit. And that's kind of where I've stacked my chips is in this this idea of cognitive liberty that you're an adult. I don't need to infantilize this with you. If you want to eat mushrooms, you take responsibility for yourself. If you're not causing harm to anyone, if you want to smoke DMT seven nights in a row at your house, that should be your prerogative as long as you're not causing harm to anyone. So that's where I'm at right now, but I'm always evolving my perspectives. And that's part of why I publicly share so much of my writing on the podcast, et cetera, because I actually want my perspectives to be challenged. And I don't want to cling on to them thinking, I know the right way to do these things. Like these are really complex, nuanced topics that we're diving into when you think about population level decisions. Like it'd be easy for you and me to sit here and be like, yeah, we should be able to do mushrooms. But then you start thinking about like, if you're a politician, right? Or you're someone shaping policy and you have to think about tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people and how to best and most safely roll these things out, it definitely becomes a bit more complicated. complicated. I think that's where we're at right now as a society. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, it's 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 definitely like a very very complicated issue. I'm definitely, I think, more on on your side right now, where I I think that 
people should just be allowed to do what they want. I, you know, I think that, um, but the education needs to be there is, is also the important thing. And like, I think just the education, not just about psychedelics, but like surrounding all drugs has been, uh, you know, largely propaganda, at least growing up, it was, it was largely, you know, still the war on drugs. Like I still, you know, remember the, uh, uh, the dare program. Mine was called the star program, uh, which I completely forgot what the fuck that stood for. But like, all it did was basically just teach us that like all drugs are bad. There's no legitimate use for any of them. Um, but yet like alcohol is, is again, you know, completely fine once you turn 21. Uh, <laughs> so like, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting model. And like, it's, it's been politicized so much. Like the fact that drugs have been used as, as a political gateway to oppress certain people and, and keep other people like it's, you know, like one of the one of the best examples that 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 I like to to talk about is like day drinking, for example. Like if you're rich and you have money, like day drinking's totally cool and fine. But like if you're homeless and you're like you know drinking on the street, that's now you're now not allowed to drink for whatever reason. Like you need to be working hard. You need to be doing that. But again, if you if you have money and you're a contributing member of society, it's totally fine. And so that's it's just a great like the point. way that you the way that we look at the exact same thing for different classes of people is completely different. That's such a good point that I'd never considered. And an analogous point comes to do, it has to do with it's virtuous for wealthy people to make money without doing anything because of their investments and passive income. But if the poorer class does that, they're lazy. Like you don't want to work, you don't want to bust your ass, but they're kind of the exact same thing in this sense of like being able to accrue returns based on, uh, you know, not, you're not inputting your time. So again, these are like broader, more so social or societal level issues that we're grappling with. But I consider that an honor that we get to both have platforms and podcasts and discuss these things because it is such a momentous time right now in human history. Like we're rapidly accelerating through change. I don't think anybody really knows where we're headed. We all have some mm -hmm. decent models of what the next few years could look like. But I always just fall back on feeling grateful to be here and to have an opportunity to contribute some small bit to the dialogue and to network and build connections and talk about things we're both passionate about. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, that's that's why I started this was just to, to have conversations with other cool people. And and I really like what you said about the fact that your opinions and your ideas are always changing and you you say all these things so you can actually be challenged. I think that that's incredibly important. And. I mean, one thing that just psychedelics in general have helped me with is getting out of the mindset that like, this is how I think, this is how I am. I have to stay like this. It's realizing that I don't know shit, man. Like, I don't know a goddamn thing. And so getting into that mindset and realizing that like, yes, I think this today, but like in three months from now, I could think something completely different and that's okay. I think more people need to get into that mindset regardless of how they do it. But like there just needs to be a shift in 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 the way that we're taught things and and the way that the way that we're educated, not as such a black and white, but just the fact that everything is a gray area. There's there's really no such thing as black and white. It's super important to be mindful of that dynamic. And as far as the black and white, I think that there's this pressure and expectation upon a lot of people that I think social media plays a huge role in amplifying this. To, be, to become an expert or be an expert overnight. That's something we've noticed a lot, right? And I often make the joke that with virology, like when the pandemic hit, everybody in your timeline is all of a sudden a virologist and an expert <laughs> in how things work. And then Ukraine and Russia happens, and now they're geopolitical experts overnight. And it's kind of the same with psychedelics, I think. Now they're super popular. They're super trendy. Yes, there's been a broad, a, a niche subset of the population that has used psychedelics before, but now... All of a sudden, all these experts are coming out of the woodwork. And I think one thing I want to be wary of and that I try to poke fun at with satire is people pivoting from other areas that they're experts in and using that clout, those relationships, those connections to establish thought leadership and expertise on psychedelics. But most people who have a longstanding relationship with psychedelics will be the first to distance themselves from the idea of expertise. You might say, I have a lot of experience with this. And my experience teaches me that I'm not an expert, that I can maybe offer some insights from my own path, but my path, my experience, my zeitgeist around psychedelics is going to be drastically different from someone who's accessed these in Tokyo and grew up in that worldview or from a hunter gatherer living in the remote Amazon. Like we all think 
we know something about psychedelics, but it's pretty culture bound at the end of the day. So I think that's good. And we're, we're going through a process of globalization that's rapidly accelerating that's been happening for the last 50 odd years or 500 years, depending on who you ask. And that that's bringing a lot of these different ideologies and worldviews directly head to head with each other. And we start to see a lot of social tension and a lot of friction. But at the same time, a lot of people who are optimistic about our ability to to take these insights and experiences, combine them with the insights and experiences of other people, hopefully, and then create a more global universal framework for the future is my yeah. sort of utopian vision, I guess. I love it. No, no. I mean, it's 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 all about figuring figuring out the best path forward um, based on all of the information that we have currently. Like again, like nothing's black and white. Nothing is set in stone. And and the fact that you know, I still I still talk to people that you know have have a problem with the fact. Well, like they're still they're still federally illegal, and so like that's why they don't want to touch psychedelics. But they're like, you know, the second that it's you know decriminalized or, or something like that, then they're like, yeah, like then I would give it a shot. And like in my mind, immediately, I'm like, these are made up rules. Like these are not real. Like everything we do in society is completely made up. The rules we have here are different from the rules we have in Mexico. So like, what is the true difference other than you're just sort of blindly following whatever the made up rules are in the place that you just happen to be born? Yeah. And these substances and plants have only been illegal for the last 50 years or criminalized. Right. So really, it's only a very small portion of history of human history and history of the planet where there have been these prohibitionist statutes around these plants. And the more we start to get into policy and thinking about how to move forward collectively with psychedelics, it definitely broadens the lens and invites people to examine policies around other drugs, like policies around opium and around opiates and around cocaine and coca. And I think this is good to start thinking more broadly in terms of what does the label drug or psychedelic even mean, right? Like mm -hmm. psychedelic for me means something very different than psychedelic for a tribal elder in Colorado. And I heard that during the psychedelic science conference this summer, when I went to one of the panels on indigenous reciprocity and the older gentleman who was a representative of one of the tribes in Colorado Point blank said that he had never used or been in community with anyone who used the word psychedelic, that when they consider peyote, it's not psychedelic. It's something entirely different to them. And that's something I've been hearing more and more this year from other people in the field. Jonathan Ott being one of them, huge fan of Jonathan Ott, very reclusive, eccentric, eccentric um, entheogenic researcher about the label psychedelic probably is not the best label for us to be using. Like it's kind of a crude term in a sense. There's other proposed terms like psychotomimetics and psychoplastogens, et cetera, entheogens. Entheogens. And that like psychedelic has so much cultural baggage attached to it is another thing. You know, like if you were to present to someone and I have friends like you who don't want to touch it, if you say a psychedelic, it's loaded with this cultural baggage and these the reputation precedes it. But if you were to frame it in another way, it might be easier to not think about, you know, the historic policy failures of the West and the war on drugs and to think about it in terms of, hey, this is something that may induce neuroplasticity or it's something that may enable you to live a happier, more meaningful life if used in the correct context. Well, see, I think that there that that like I, I, I agree with you in a sense, but also at the same time, I think now I've, I've seen within, you know, the psychedelic community um like everyone is now just calling it medicine like you have to call it medicine and like it's i think that's now being overused as being like yes you know i'm going on a journey with this medicine and like you can't just take mushrooms um and i think that the if we just call it medicine that then puts it back into like just the medicalized model and that like this can only be used if you have depression or you have anxiety or you're you know you're you're trying to get through something rather than just for the betterment of well people because like if, if if you're well you, you shouldn't theoretically need medicine and so by then calling it medicine it, it kind of goes back into you know sort of the same problem that we're in with the with the cultural baggage but just on the other side it really does. No, you're 100% correct. And I've definitely drawn heat for being critical of the medical model, again, mainly because that's dominating all the headlines. And the next generation or people coming into psychedelics and learning about them right now, a lot of the public opinion is being shaped by the way that these are promoted and discussed in a lot of media. And I think that, for example, when I first got really into 
mushrooms and, and wanted to read about them and learn about them. At no point was it ever a medical ambition that I had. I wanted to explore my own consciousness. I was fascinated by Terence McKenna and by Arrowhead and by Mark Plotkin and these different writers who would describe vividly these detailed phantasmagoric visions they had. And it just made so much sense to me also growing up in the church and having these stories of the burning bush and of, you know, visionary experiences imprinted onto my psyche. Once I started learning more about these other cultures and these traditions who would have mushrooms or other plants and go into these altered states that were very detailed and very intelligent, that piqued my interest. And it was never about, oh, I want to solve this problem immediately. It was always about, I want to take seven grams of mushrooms and I want to have some visions and I want to explore this and find out what it means in my own life. And that journey still continues today. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. So I do want to pivot a little bit and talk about like a, a very small thing that you mentioned earlier is the fact that these platforms is, uh, you know, essentially allow us to to independently provide our thoughts on, you know, the the the, the ongoing revolution, let's let's call it that we're in. Um, and I want to I want to ask your opinions on like the importance of being an independent journalist, and also what does it feel like to get banned, man? It's a badge of honor. Thanks for asking. <laughs> the second platform that Micopreneur has been deplatformed from, the first being TikTok, a number of years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And I think what I'm concerned about is not just little old me that my network got destabilized and it presents some challenges fiscally. I had sponsors I was working with, et cetera, who want to reach a broad audience, which I had a lot of traffic on that particular Instagram page. But it's more about conserving independent journalism and unique critical perspectives. And you touched on this briefly earlier about the education gap with drugs and with psychedelics, that you have the star model, I have the dare model. Those are prohibitionist, just say no, don't do it. And then on the other end of that spectrum, you have a lot of marketing and hype and people opportunists jumping on psychedelics and pushing them and saying, everybody should do ketamine, everybody should do psychedelics, this and that. But this creates cognitive dissonance is what it does. It's like, where's that room in the middle about like, yeah, I'm an unabashed proponent of psychedelics personally, but I also don't think that you just take mushrooms and your depression goes away or you just do this and, and it's the magic pill. Yeah. So I think that's the importance of a critical independent lens and being a journalist as I've noticed this culture of yes men and yes people, right? Is like people who want to praise anything that's happening. There's this brand coming out. Let's praise them. There's this conference. Let's praise them. Almost as though people are afraid to be Toxic. critical. Yeah, it's like positivity. I, I've noticed that. And like in some ways, people are incentivized to do that because you want to build your network and you want to be in. You want to get yeah. put on. You want everyone but, to like you because then they're going to introduce you to more people that will then like you. And then somehow down the line, this will equate to money. Well, that's it, I think. And that, you know, we should not be needlessly, recklessly critical because we don't like something, but more about we should be honest. And if you have an experience and be that with psychedelics or with a retreat center or with a conference or whatever, like anytime somebody is overtly negative about something or overtly, deeply, deeply positive about something, I kind of like inherently I'm skeptical about their point of view. And, and that's like over a prolonged timeline, not necessarily on just one review they give. But when people are more in the middle about stuff or a little more centrist, I'm more willing to listen to their, you know, when they praise someone or when they critique someone. So that's one of the things I want to get out of the way. And I think that's just where our socio-political zeitgeist or perspective is right now collectively that we're either like on one side of the spectrum or on the other side of the spectrum. It's this hyper polarity. And especially with drugs, with psychedelics, that can be bad because if you're just uniformly praising this one thing, like, oh, you take mushrooms and it's going to heal your problems. Well, there's whole amounts of other substances that are tremendously beneficial to people. And mm -hmm. so we require nuance. And then as far as getting deplatformed, that is something that is definitely a, a badge of honor and also tremendously frustrating because it feels so arbitrary, like zero warning, zero content strikes. I had a story taken down several months ago advertising a book. It was a book, but the book had the title Psilocybin Mushrooms in it. And I got a, a, a warning and then I appealed it. And whoever looked at it or whatever censor was like, oh, it's a book. We probably shouldn't be banning books, right? Like it's mm -hmm. a little bit different. So again, zero content strikes, zero warnings. 
I posted an ad in collaboration with a Canna company who had contracted me to do this. And then boom, just offline immediately after for regulated goods. But the irony is Wonderland Conference was sponsored by a Canna company in part, mm -hmm. right? It's legal. And also, so Canna's, we Canna's legal. <laughs> yeah, it's just like it becomes, and, and not again, not just me, but like, multiple other people I have a lot of respect for were censored and restricted on that same day. So I think a new content policy specifically with Meta went into play. But for example, Luna Stower, she's a executive at a publicly traded cannabis company, one of the rock stars in cannabis, especially women, visionary cannabis leaders and entrepreneurs. And she had her platform restricted and censored for posting a photo of women at a blunt brunch, which was an industry event. And it's like, we can't make up our minds collectively. Like, are we pro drugs? Are we anti drugs? You know, we're kind of somewhere in the middle, but what we should not be doing is censoring and deplatforming legitimate independent perspectives who have earned that position. And like, if you were able to actually have a human go and look at this person's profile, you'd say, mm -hmm. this is who we want speaking about cannabis, or this is who yeah. we want interjecting their perspectives into the conversation on psychedelics. What we don't want is this complete black hole and then people are afraid to talk about it. And then you start misspelling the words like that shit drives me crazy, dude. It's like, like when you have to use like a, a fucking zero. It, you know? Yeah, yeah. You have to say it's microdosing with like them. a zero is one of the O's and like all that. I appreciate people need to do that. But like collectively, the, the other very strange thing is the day that I got deplatformed, I'm over on Twitter, totally separate platform. And without following any of these accounts, I'm getting all this prohibitionist anti-cannabis propaganda in my timeline, like parents against pot, Kevin Sabet, who's like one of the most notorious political policy advisors who's anti-cannabis and anti-drug. I'm like, mm -hmm. it just seems very strange that some legitimate perspectives and advocates who are taking a more tempered, nuanced approach get censored and deplatformed. And then this alarmist propaganda is all of a sudden filling that void. And I start thinking a little bit more macro level about what's going on in our society. So that's yeah. my long winded answer to your question, Cam. I, I, I have this really love hate relationship with Instagram and just social media as a whole. Uh, because one, like we don't control it. So like at the end of the day, like they can theoretically just ban you and there's really not shit that you can do about it. But yet at the same time, it's also still, in my opinion, the best way to reach a broader audience because there are so many eyeballs on it and so many different people, so many different perspectives that are on it. But yet we still have no control over it at the end of the day. So like they've they've made it very, very hard to independently outside of these platforms actually build any of that following, which I don't have any sort of solution for. Um, but it's, it's, it's just interesting to think about. Like, it's a, it's, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment of like, well, how do we build our brands? Like I've grown trip sitting just basically on Instagram. Like, yeah, I have TikTok too, but like, it's mainly just been Instagram and reaching out to people and DMing. And I've met some absolutely amazing people from it, but yet, you know, outside of this, I have no idea how the fuck I would grow this. Yeah. And I totally respect that I sign on to Instagram or Meta's terms and conditions and honestly haven't really been making a big deal of it. I've been honest about like, yeah, it's kind of a blow to the platform because, for example, that professional network on Instagram that I had grown organically to 25,000 people. I had people all over the world, journalists for major publications and Netflix showrunners. I had Cleveland, the voice of Cleveland, Cleveland from Family Guy, people like that who are like, you know, I, I don't know them well enough to ask for their phone numbers or whatever. And I have been able to migrate a lot of my audience and network off of Instagram, which is something I intentionally did earlier in the year, is do more LinkedIn, build the newsletter, have the .com. But as you said, that's where all the traffic is already. So in some ways, when you're trying to build a bigger following, it's almost futile to try to direct them to your website. I still encourage people to do it, but like just try to build an organic following from scratch as a bootstrapper with a .com, which I have a very nice professionally designed website. Shout out Nate Sigard and Get Authentic. But like, I realized like I'd post something on Instagram and boom, I would get occasionally 100,000 views in a day, you know, or like uh, 20,000 views immediately. And you post the same thing on your website and maybe you get 700 views. So like it becomes quite difficult to justify putting all the time and energy. Now at the end of the day, you do own the content on your website. And I'm just back in the camp thinking from this experience and learning from it that it's really not about me. I think it's good to get beyond that. And like, there's this weird idea that like, you have to be a leader, you have to do this and that. And you, you know, everyone's always trying to flex. Like I was in this publication and I did this, but at the end of the day, it's really all of us. And I see that 
it's a war on drugs. And I look at you as like a brother in the war on drugs. Like we're trying to effectively yeah. crusade against bad policy and there should be different leaders. There's, there doesn't need to be like, this person is the psychedelic celebrity. Like that's kind mm -hmm. of an oxymoron in a way. Like it's really all of us. And if you have, you know, a hundred followers or a hundred thousand followers, if you're doing good quality work, that's what matters. And if you're making actual tangential contributions, that's so much more than what matters. And my last thought I'll wrap up with on this bit is like when I started my newsletter, I think I had a hundred subscribers and like a dozen of them were people who were writing for high profile magazines and websites and so on and so forth. And one of those readers is really what opened the door to me getting a lot of opportunities and getting press passes and conference invites. So it really doesn't matter, honestly, at the end of the day, if you have a huge amount of followers, as long as you just keep putting out consistently good content, it will get picked up. You will get opportunities from it. So basically, just in, in summary, quality, not quantity. <laughs> I think so. That's what I, I'm all about. I try to be about. I, I, I completely, completely agree with that. Like I'd, I'd much rather have a, a smaller, tight knit community and, and, and group of people that I can actually reach out to rather than, you know, a hundred thousand people. And like, maybe I know 10 of them. Um, I think that that's, you know, that's, that's just like chasing clout at the end of the day. Um, but no, thank you. Thank you for, for, for sharing your perspective. I was, I was definitely curious to, uh, curious to hear that. Um, I guess all, like also too, like, can you, can you appeal the ban or like, are you like, what is, what does the process even fucking look like? So there's literally one person that everybody has recommended and I don't know his secret sorcery, how he does it, but I'm contracted him right now. I'm in touch with him and he's working on recovering my account and that's great. But like, just as an example, you know, just this weekend, I had like three people I really look up to who have been in the psychedelic space a long time and who are more established, who started following me on Instagram. And it's one of those things where I'm like, you know, that that sort of visibility to people has opened a lot of doors and it will continue to open doors for you and for other people publicly sharing. We're like, because of that Instagram presence, I got invited to go to England and to speak and to, you know, have this incredible experience at breaking convention, so on and so forth. Like because of that Instagram presence is inevitably what opened the door for me to MC psychedelic science and maps. So mm -hmm. like it's a tool. I'm very, very stoked that Instagram and meta exists. But then it's more about the sense of like random, arbitrary deplatforming. Like I get it. If I violated content with a particular video, like give me a strike, give me a warning. Mm -hmm. But like the sense of just like, nope, you're done. You're out. Your whole network and all these people. It's fine in a sense that I'm rebuilding. I have a you know great network off Instagram. But there's just so many more people where I think, oh, man, I don't even know how to get in touch with that person from India. You know, we've just been Instagram buddies. So I would advise anybody who's doing it just like, no, it comes with the territory. It kind of happens to a lot of accounts like yeah. Beard Brothers, Beard Bros, great, great cannabis independent media account that's been around forever. And they got deplatformed at 120,000 and had to rebuild. And the same thing, just like kind of, you know, they're doing quality work. And then randomly, boom, they're gone. Okay, well, now we have to rebuild. And that's when it's your calling in a sense. Like if I wasn't deeply invested in this, I'd probably just be like, oh, well, fuck it. I'm over it. But instead, it's like, no, this is what I do. Like I can't really imagine going back to being a high school teacher, which I've done before, <laughs> or you know, doing what – like I've led a church youth group before. Those were cool chapters in my life. But like micropreneur is 100% what I want to be doing. So if that – account goes down, then I just focus on other things and do what you can control, which is jumping on podcasts with friends and learning together. Yeah, 100%, man. Well, uh, well said. And, and part of what you said just towards the end there about some of these opportunities that you've had with some of these conferences is a great segue into uh, my next question for you, which is, I know you've obviously been to a lot of conferences this year. So I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the ones that have like really, really stood out to you in, in maybe a, a, a surprising way or um, just some just some really great ones that, you know, the rest of us haven't necessarily heard of. Breaking Convention, first and foremost, they are the largest psychedelic research conference in Europe. It takes place in England. This year was at the University of Exeter, which is in Devon, a beautiful rolling green hill countryside in the Shire of England. So that was really special for a number of reasons. But why I want to shout them out is I feel like they're very true to the universal vision of psychedelics in that they have the medical clinical side. They had Paul Stamets, they had Rick Doblin, they had Amanda Fielding, who I got to interview and all of that track. But then they also had 
Psytrance festival organizers speaking. They had a whole track on underground raves. They had a whole track with with uh, the Kalindi Iyi stage, who you're probably nice. familiar with Kalindi. But I first found Kalindi's work through Breaking Convention. And you've been to some conferences now. How many conferences have you seen an old black dude talking about 20 gram mushroom doses and subatomic realities and comedic research? Literally right. none. So Kalindi was the person who was talking about this and has a whole generation of disciples and students now who are carrying forth that legacy, Mudu Baki. I just had him on the podcast, got to hang out with him in England at Breaking Convention. That is what makes it special. And that rather than focusing on the bottom line and who can pay the most and where the sponsors are, it's a more holistic presentation and view of what's happening in psychedelics. Because I think that the clinical medical side is very important, but so is the underground UK Psytrance with mm -hmm. 30,000 people doing an underground festival on a farm in Hungary or Portugal. Like that's a huge part of psychedelic culture. So that's the first one I want to shout out. They do it every other year. Definitely tap into Breaking Convention and check out their YouTube channel. Great talks. I've got a talk up there. Huge respect for what they do. That one comes to mind. Of course, the psychedelic science one was monumental for a lot of reasons. You were there. And really, I think that was cause to celebrate just how mainstream, in a lot of ways, the psychedelic conversation has be become, you know, yeah. like for a lot of us, we're used to just kind of like doing our thing on the underground. But then all of a sudden, there's four, 12, there's 12,000 people and you've got Jaden Smith and Andrew Huberman and Aaron Rodgers and it's getting covered in every mainstream yeah. media like that was really eye opening to be like, whoa, I, I distinctly remember being right next to the stage when the opening ceremony was happening and Rick Perry was talking and, and Izzy and Liana and Natalie from maps were talking and looking out over that venue. And it was just the sea of people like I've never, ever seen before coming together for psychedelics. That's the second one. Third one, always got to shout out anything that Oakland Haife and Reggie are doing by far. Their conferences are the most roots level, mycelial level, underground, inclusive, and impactful events that I've been to. And I've been to three of them now, the California conference twice in LA and the Oakland conference. And they, they bring a huge crowd. They bring an involved crowd, a passionate crowd. And, you know, they give, as you said, 50 tickets to the hood. You know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're out there making sure everybody who wants to get in is getting in. There's none of this $800 and, you know, this and that and the other. It's like, you want to get in, you get in. So huge fan of everything that Reggie's doing. And they just announced that their conference this year is in that. Jamaica, which is super, super cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, gonna be fucking sweet. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I've met him. I actually, I, you, you were the one that sort of introduced me to Reggie um, at uh, Wonderland. That was the first time that I uh, uh, that I ran into him. But I had been, I'd been following him for uh, uh, for a while now. And yeah, huge, huge fan of everything that he does. And he's just like a very, very genuine, like real individual. Like he's not, he's not bullshitting. He's not saying what like he thinks that you want to hear. Like he's just being fucking him and like that's that's what i love about a lot of the people that i do meet like within this space is like the real genuine humans that like you can tell like they're speaking from their heart and like they're doing this because this is what they love to do like that's what i love about this community um and not 100%. everybody's like that but but that's those are those are the people that i tend to gravitate towards yeah, I think we need to have sincerity. I think social media and online personas has in some ways contributed to this, the Instagramification of reality, as we say, of like wanting to put filters on, wanting to be palatable to everyone. But I also think with psychedelics, that sincerity is so important, being genuine, being sincere. And, and that's what I feel about Reggie and a lot of people is like they might have this online persona where people who don't know them are like, oh, this person's really outspoken and this and that. And those things may be true. But at the end of the day, they're very sincere people. They're very genuine people. And that it's hard to get a handle on that when you're only connecting with someone through a screen. So that's, again, why I think the in-person events are so important. There's been so many times when I've met someone and maybe they know who I am and vice versa. And then like they don't actually know you and you have a conversation and like, oh, like I see your stuff floating around online and I have this perception of you. But like when you can sit down, you can talk to someone, you can be in community with them. That's when all that other bullshit goes away. And that's what's important at the end of the day. And like I definitely grandstand and have theatricality by design and some of my online persona like. I have a background in storytelling and like, that's what you do. Like you get up on stage and you have some pizzazz, right? But like 
far more important than that is building authentic community and and making sure that you're reciprocating that in your own life. Because I think it's really easy to get out there and talk. You go on the lecture conference circuit and you're getting booked and you're getting paid gigs. And like, and at the end of the day, I'm like, hey, when's the last time you actually checked in with yourself and had a solo mushroom dose or, you know, mm-hmm. checked in with your family? Like, I think those are really important things. And this idea of like psychedelic influencers and celebrities uh, <laughs> in some ways sends the wrong message. Yeah, 100 percent. And I do I do want to just give you like a really, really quick shout out too. is like one when I I remember when I first like invited you on the podcast a year ago, I was like fucking surprised that you even like responded because like that was when you were, you know, in, in, in my mind again, I did not know who you were, but look like you were blown up, had all these things to do. And like I DM you and you're like, fuck, yeah, let's do it. Uh, and then also too, when you were in, uh, when you were in Chicago and we just, we just met up and, and, and spent a day at the zoo and like, I actually got to know you and that was, I mean, just really, really fucking cool. So like for anybody that does see Dennis's stuff and think like, oh, he's, you know, just doing all this satire stuff. Like you are a genuine motherfucker and I appreciate you so much for that. Likewise, dude. And you know, i I'm humbled to be invited onto your podcast. So thank you. Cause I see you blowing up too. And it's, it's not about the numbers. It's about the quality of work again. And like, I'm taken aback by the attention to detail, the sincerity, the focus, the drive. And like, you know, I had people early on when I was starting Micopreneur who are established industry professionals, either with cannabis or psychedelics or whatever, like people with maps or, or PR companies who really gave me a vote of confidence and sort of saying the same thing, being like, hey, you didn't have a lot of followers, but like everything I saw that you were doing, I just really liked it. So I wanted to support you. And like, and I would, you know, encourage people to extend that forward. Like, don't just do stuff because people are well known or have clout. Like, mm-hmm. we also have to, you know, influence and help and cultivate and be available for people who don't have their moment in the spotlight because it's coming. And as is the case right now, one day you might be deep platform, right? Or I'm, yeah. I'm taking off my platform. <laughs> that was, that was, sudden, that was oh, one of the one of the thoughts that came to me after I saw that to you. I'm like, oh fuck, am I next? <laughs> nah, no, I mean, it just comes with the territory. And I would yeah. say, like, just do you and build organically build offline you know and but don't stop sharing on instagram obviously it's still a great tool Mm -hmm. for sure so uh, i'm i'm curious where where you live in mexico what does the like the the mushroom scene i guess look like there like how is it how is it talked about in a way that's maybe different from over here in the u.s and you know what are some of the maybe similarities that you see as well That's such a great question, Cam. So I'm deeply embedded in the mushroom community here and have been for a number of years. And I've prioritized working with local mycologists because because of Mexico's relaxed scheduling and regulation around psychedelics, like decriminalization of 5-MeO-DMT, of mushrooms, et cetera, it encourages and invites a lot of people to open retreat centers and healing centers. And that's not really a scene I wanted to be a part of. Like I've been around it. You kind of see it, you get invited to stuff, but I wanted to be working, you know, hand it on my knees out in the, in the forest, searching through mushrooms and the forest floor with locals. And so one of the groups I work with is called Fungaria. They're probably my closest allies down here, F-U-N-G-A-R-I-A. And it would shock you to know that most of these people who have dedicated their lives to mycological research don't even trip. They're not that interested in it. You know, they're interested in mushrooms. They're interested in the ethnographic use of mushrooms. We've gone out with local indigenous tribes. I've interviewed people living in the jungle who grew up eating mushrooms that their parents cooked, right? Like before they even had roads into their town. So like, to me, these are really deeply beautiful framings of mycology and of mushrooms. And I think especially us, we like to fetishize and romanticize psychedelic mushrooms. But for a lot of people, it's just embedded in the culture. You know, their grandparents were doing it. It's not as exciting if it's like, oh yeah, the people in my village have been doing that for a long time. And like, so I think that's part of it is working with a few legit academic mycologists here who publish peer reviewed papers and have PhDs on the subject. It really kind of takes it off of this pedestal that a lot of people have put it on where it's like, somehow it's different. It's like our culture is different than the mushroom experience. It's t- completely overlapping here. So yeah. that's the first thing I'll say. And like this idea of of like mushroom celebrities, a lot of people think it's kind of funny because they're like, dude, we've been working with these for like, you know, millennia for <laughs> hundreds of years. And like all of a sudden people care about it now and they don't want our perspectives. You know, we're yeah. not invited. So yeah, I, I, that's my take on it. And we did a festival over the summer called Yui Fest, Y-U-Y, which is the name of a local Amanita that grows here. 
And we had a thousand people a day coming through this because it was in the middle of town. There were, you know, it was very community oriented. It was very artisanal. And that's real mushroom people. Like most people who are really into mushrooms that you meet are not really about the clout. Like they're about, you know, they're, they're cultivating their mushrooms. They're studying. They have their friends they go foraging with. But like a lot of them don't even have an online presence. So, yeah, yeah that, that's that's kind of the community I'm embedded in. And I'm very fortunate for it. Yeah, that's awesome. Like not not doing it just because it's like the cool and like it thing to do. They just do it because they just genuinely love it. Uh, and that's that's fucking awesome. Yeah, it's beautiful too to, to learn more about the lineage and the history. And as I dropped my most recent podcast episode with Mudu Baki, who I'm a huge fan of, you should definitely try to get him on the podcast. He talked about Africa and he's been to Africa six times with Kalindi Iyi on research trips and embedded with local cultures, which he didn't want to name because they gatekeep their traditions because of colonialism. Because in a lot of cases, which is also true in parts of Mexico, then when, when colonialists and conquistadors came, the first thing to go is the sacred traditions as they'll try to, and the same thing in Europe, like try to suppress the use of different plants. And I know this is something that our mutual friend Sophie has talked about, right? It's about like the, the witch traditions. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the first things to go is to try to squash that. So sensibly, a lot of cultures have developed these guardrails and they gatekeep it. And Mudu told me that he encountered four different tribes that have psychedelic or ancestral mushroom use and lineages, which are not ever spoken about or written about in literature, A, because an anthropologist showing up to a remote region of Africa, who's going to let them in on those traditions if they're aware of what's happened to all the surrounding tribes? That's one. Yeah. And another one is that, as he frames it, and I think the same is true in Mexico, the sort of spiritual cosmology or the invisible world and the waking everyday world are so integrated that there's not necessarily a distinction between the two. Like if you, if you go up to someone and you say, Hey, show me where these plants are, this plant, or, you know, show me where this experience, they'll be like, what are you talking about? Oh, the, the, this one that we use, like, it's not this mm -hmm. sense of like, they're totally different. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a very traditional frame of reference there that I'm paraphrasing here. But for example, in markets in Mexico, you'll find different DMT containing plants. And there are people who will synthesize this and make chonga out of it, right? Which is sort of like a smokable DMT. And this tradition actually exists across the Caribbean, across Latin America, across South America, but there's not a lot of oral literature about, sorry, there's not a lot of literature. It's a lot of oral traditions and it's not shared with outsiders. So there are people that I'm connected to, some of whom you got to meet last week in Miami who are actively researching this stuff where in Puerto Rico and in the Caribbean and various islands, they actually have a history of usage of DMT containing plants. It's just not trumpeted as far and wide as maybe ayahuasca or like oh, yeah, a I mean, liquid, mushroom block. Look what's, look what's also, you know, happening in, you know, Peru right now, for example, or like Colombia with the amount of shamans that you can just find on the street that'll basically be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll you know, just come to ayahuasca with me, you know, only, only 200 bucks. Um, it's, it's becoming this, this, and, and again, I'm, I'm, that's, that's how I did ayahuasca. Like, I'm not going to pretend like I'm not part of that too. Like that got me very interested in it and I wanted a way to access it. Um, but like at the same time, I, I do see how that's, that's, you know, taking over maybe parts of their culture. Cause like the ways that they traditionally use it, it's, it's not the way that we're going right now where like everybody is all in a circle and doing it. Like traditionally, a lot of the shit people, uh, people, the way that they would use it is just the coranderos and curanderos. They're the only ones that are taking it. They're not giving it to everybody in a circle. They're using it. And then they're using that wisdom and knowledge to then help heal others. But it's not everybody in a giant circle taking it at once. So like we've, we've, we're, we're already whitewashing it in a way. Such a good point. One that I often make. And that also, for example, Huatla de Jimenez, where Maria Sabina is from and that whole lineage, having been there twice, they not everybody eats mushrooms there. It's a misconception that like everybody eats mushrooms. It's like talking to people, they say, oh, maybe 30 percent, you know, maybe like three out of 10 or the case like the, the curandera will eat the mushrooms and then we'll tell the person what they need after that. So mm -hmm. I think there's the misnomer or misconception about like how these things are done. And there's quite a few good researchers or people living in those communities that can offer a lot more on that particular topic. But I also agree with you in the sense that I strongly believe in cognitive liberty, but also we should be critical of our participation in certain systems. And the first time 
three times. I've been to Peru three times to drink ayahuasca, 2010 to 2012. And I had no idea about this broader contextual framework of like the ceremonial economy and like who owns the centers and how this works. All I know, which I extend this empathy to a lot of people, is that I could access this down there and that I didn't have access to it where I was. So I have compassion for that. But I hope that these types of discussions and involving more perspectives, we can hopefully start to develop some best practices, not just with regulation of psychedelics and, and substances in the U.S., but worldwide. And uh, and like I'm a big advocate, for example, of if you can make a 50-50 center where it's like 50 percent of the profits without, you know, with full transparency, 50 percent goes to the indigenous people and then 50 percent to the other providers. And this is obviously not a perfect foolproof model, but the idea there makes a lot more sense because right now it's essentially like if you have the money, you can go to Jamaica or Peru, you can buy a center for a couple hundred thousand bucks, and then you can pay local people three dollars an hour or whatever while you're yeah. charging for so you're I, charging I do think five thousand like five thousand dollars for a guest to stay there for a week. It's, it's and, I, and I and I also too, this is like I, I literally work for a uh, retreat center down in Costa Rica. Like I, I essentially sell ayahuasca retreats. Like I, I am participating in this as much, but I am also critical of it at the exact same time. And like, that's where back to what we were talking about way earlier is like, there isn't just one way to do this. Like it's, 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 if, if you're all for like, oh, everybody needs to go to a retreat, like the retreat model, like Sophie actually just, just wrote something on Shroom Town. Um, sort of, I mean, basically just, just questioning the retreat model, like saying like, guys, like this isn't the silver bullet that like a lot of these retreat centers are, are, are saying that they are like, if, if you're going to a center and they're promising to cure you of your depression and all of that, like maybe be a little bit skeptical. There's, there's not, you know, a silver bullet that's going to, uh, that's going to fix everything. And like, we need to be openly skeptical, skeptical and, you know, uh, a little bit critical of all of it as we continue to go along. Cause that's, what's going to make it better at the end of the day. Yeah. And at the same time, as we both know, bringing in a bunch of income in certain economically depressed areas can really benefit those communities. And literally, no matter what you do, you're never going to keep everybody happy. I think that's important to know as a, you know, working for any center or as a content creator. Like I had somebody, a young whippersnapper who I was really stoked and inspired by at the conference last week in Miami come up to me working for one of the big orgs in the space. And he was like picking my brain about all these questions about content creation. And I was stoked that he wanted to ask me. But one of the things he said is like, how do you, when you're making content, make sure you're not going to offend anybody. I'm like, oh, it's an honor to offend people. Like if you're not offending people, your content's not going to get very far. So that's another thing I encourage, which I think you do really well is like just be a little bit outspoken sometimes and like take on controversial issues. And that goes back to the independent journalism where like we shouldn't have other thought leaders and people deciding everything for us. Like, oh, if this person says it, like if Joe Rogan says it, then that must be the truth. Or if on the other side, they say it, that must be the truth. Like we need a bunch of diff different perspectives and people who are willing to take on sticky, messy, controversial subjects and hopefully to do so transparently and be like, Hey man, if that take didn't resonate with everyone, like I hope it helps build my core audience. And that's what I've always tried to do is like build a core audience because people kind of on the fringes who are like, oh, a little bit, I like you a little, they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. And as a mm -hmm. content creator or as a business person, you just have to accept that. That like, yeah, like literally had somebody come sing my praises, greatest content ever, such genius, this and that, kissing my ass. And then like a week later, I posted something they didn't like and they're just like criticizing me and what, a, what an idiot I am. And I was just like, bro, like that's all in your head, you know, like that's that's all you. So I'm not concerned about about that. I think that's important to note as well. Yeah. So, I mean, be be original, be authentic, be you and like you will you will attract the right people. Like that was just a, a, a very big lesson of that, that that psychedelics have very much taught me is that. I'm not going to please everyone, but not only that, I don't have to please everyone. <laughs> like we don't, we don't have to be friends with every single person that we come across. Like I can respect you and not want anything to do with you at the exact same time. And that's completely okay. Like, you know, we, 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 we want to be around other like-minded folks, but at the same time too, like even people that openly disagree with me, I know follow me and we'll talk to each other about the things that we disagree on. And that'll make us both smarter at the end of the day. Dude, the idea of having a prolonged beef with someone makes no sense to me post 
psychedelics, you know, for many years. It's like, you can disagree with someone. You need to learn how to put up boundaries sometimes. But like the idea of like having these dueling, longstanding, like, you know, arguments with someone is really not my style, right? It's like, hey, like, you know, for example, I often am critical of microdosing for a number of reasons. But like, I have so many friends who run microdosing companies and brands. And we just kind of like, it's a playful dialogue and discourse that we have. And, you know, so whenever I'm on the receiving end of that, of like, which has happened a number of times, where like people really don't like me for some reason. Almost like the worst thing from their perspective is when you just don't care. You're just like, mm-hmm. all right, whatever, dude. Like my whole mantra is I seek to avoid imperial entanglements, which comes from Star Wars. But like I very much consider myself like a Han Solo sort of like rebel figure, if you will. And it's like the last thing I want to do is go like kicking up controversy and noise for the sake of that. You know, it's like if we have a issue or whatever, happy to resolve it offline. Happy to extend respect to you. And I'm going to keep doing my thing, which typically doesn't involve trying to drag other people and brands down. You know, and I think that's different. Like we should call out bad actors, but the idea of like making your whole platform about trying to, no, dude, it's like, if I say something, I said it and it's happened a few times and then I'll have a call with the person, you know, they'll be like, Hey man, let's jump on a call. We jump on a call. Boom. Done. Over. I said what I said. So I just think that's also important to know. Like we live in this culture where for some reason it's cool to critique people all the time, but like say your piece, move on. There's bigger fish to fry. Yeah, exactly. If you're, if you're following like what you truly believe in, like, you know, what, whatever reason that you're doing this, like that's going to win at the end of the day. Like it's about longevity. Like it's, it's, it's hard to sometimes get caught up in the like, Oh, like I want to make this thing because like, I know it'll get like a lot of attention and a lot of likes and a lot of, you know, stir a bunch of controversy, but like at the same time, like that's, that's kind of just a sidetrack. Like that's not really where I'm actually headed. Uh, and I've, I, I know a lot of, you know, creators that get caught up in that. Like they, they, they have one thing that hits really, really well. And then they're like, oh, I'm going to make my entire thing this now. They just completely pivot and like lose sight of why they were doing it to begin with. Yeah, that's really important to note. And it's sort of a fucked up reality about social media is that negativity gets more attention. And there's been a lot of studies done on this and that people feel compelled to weigh in and to bandwagon. And like, you know, that can be leveraged to a certain degree, but I think it has to be done intelligently and not done for the sake of stirring up outrage. Like if you have something to say on a hot button issue, say it. But again, like when I'm rebuilding sort of my following now, it is tempting to be like, oh, if I do this particular bit, you know, where I talk about this subject or whatever, like it's going to draw a lot of attention. But like at the end of the day, not all attention is good attention. Like, do I want my audience to be composed of people who are just haters? No, like I want intelligent, nuanced, open-minded people who will give me the benefit of the doubt if I go negative. Like I don't want to be all positive, but I don't want to be all negative either. So I think, you know, no one has it really figured out. A few people do. They'll sell you their formulas and an online class you can take. But like negativity definitely generates traction and buzz. And that says a lot, I think, about the status quo in our, our culture right now globally. Yeah. Well, Dennis, man, uh, before we go, I guess, is there is there anything else that you would like to say to the audience, to anybody, you know, anything that you're up to that, uh, that you're really excited about um, before we uh, head out? Yeah, absolutely. I just say I would love to build individual relationships with people. I'll answer every message and say what's up and happy to help support where I can. And there's a lot of reasons to be stoked about life right now. I feel like everywhere you look, especially online, there's all this energy and and powers that be that want us to feel disconnected and upset and sad and this and that. But like, go within, I think. Like, go find that good shit that's happening because there's good shit happening right now inside of us and in our communities and build around that and keep listening to the Trip Sitting Podcast. You'll be fine. (laughs) Well, thank you, Dennis. I fucking love you, man. Uh, I appreciate you. And uh, until next time. Dude, likewise, Cam. Thanks so much for the invitation. And I'm honored to be your first repeat guest and keep killing it, dude. I see you. Thank you. Much love, brother. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening to this incredible episode with an incredible human being, Dennis Walker. Make sure that you are following Micropreneur. Seriously, his content is fucking A+. Plus. Uh, one of the first people that I remember that I really looked up to uh, when I first started podcasting and, and also to make sure that you're listening to the Micropreneur podcast. Uh, it is truly, truly amazing. And he has some, he has on some just 
phenomenal guest that uh, I typically look to. And then I'm like, fuck, I need to get that guy. Uh, but either way, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I hope you have a blessed and fantastic week. If you're still listening this far, that's insane. But thank you so much. Uh, I love you all. And we'll see you on the next episode.